ko fitarea te monga, ko raukawa te moana, ko no paramata aho, ko Samantha toko ingawa. Um, he rata aho, ko te tumu whakarai e te whare tahurata o e te roa aho, he mihi nui tiene ki e koto, e paiana e toana, no reira tina koto, tina koto, tina tato katoa. I'd like to thank um, the Ministry of Health for inviting me here today. And I'm pleased to be speaking as to you today on behalf of the Royal New Zealand College of General Practitioners. We represent more than 5,000 general practitioner fellows or specialists, specialists too is our new hashtag, and trainees and from across the country. Although I've been president for less than a year, I've been working in general practice for more than 20. And I've gained valuable insight into how our health system and the demand for care and the high quality of health services in New Zealand have also managed with my previous work in the college to see many other health services around the globe. Although our health system performs well compared to many countries, there's a lot more we can do. And today I'll be speaking to you about mental health and general practice from two perspectives, caring for our patients and caring for ourselves. I've been reading a book recently called Range by David Epstein. I hope someone's read it because it's a great book. It has a discussion and insights into how broadening your skills helps to develop expertise. GPs in New Zealand are experts at range and truly use a variety of skills every day. We are also expert in specific things and mental health is one of them. I've also read some of Hi Ara Oranga, the government report on mental health and addiction and every general practitioner would, be, would applaud the first two recommendations to give more people more access to services and more choice and to transform primary health care. General, general practitioners are all for increasing access, but transformation sometimes feels a bit scary. So mental health, why are so GPs so good at it? Mental health never turns up in isolation. I'll explain this with a story. Now, I did notice that Anthony Hill's here. This isn't really about a patient, but it, um, <laughs> I'll try and be discreet. Grandmother, ne, grandma never found a life partner, and so had many. She had also never been taught to parent, so did not do it very well. Her cluster of children were generally neglected and brought up by each other. Now, I think my children would say the same. <laughs> um, these children have their children their own children and grandchildren, and some of them struggle with the same issues as grandma, but nearly all of them are determined to do better. This is not easy, and when things get tough, it's easy to turn to alcohol, drugs, get anxious and depressed. Each of the children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren have had a moment when they've seen their GP as things are unravelling. They can't tell the full story in 15 minutes. They won't tell their story to anyone they don't trust. Fortunately, this whānau has a long relationship with their GP. One day, Jay comes in, didn't miss the appointment this time. Jay says they are the black sheep of the family and not very well connected. Sleep has been really bad and Jay has been drinking heavily to nod off. Jay works in the postal service and the poor sleep affects their work and so does drinking. The GP knows that sharing a bit of themselves often helps people open up the GP starts chatting about the postal service and losing things in the mail. And the GP explains how they had stayed in a house once where the owner had died, the ashes had been sent by post and got lost. And then jokingly, the GP wondered if the creaking floorboards was the chap walking the floors. Jay suddenly lights up. Do you believe in ghosts, Jay says. Now, they would, say, would they say that to someone they don't trust? Being open to spiritual health, the GP says, yes. And it turns out it, Jay uses alcohol to sleep because they dream about grandma coming to take them away and stealing things from them and feel like it's the spirit or ghost of grandma in their dreams. It feels so real that Jay does not want to dream and alcohol stops that. Jay agrees to attending, attending alcohol and addiction services but has no one to support them to go. The GP goes with them. Jay um, also confesses to being involved with a drug deal and agrees with the GP to stop doing that. The GP provides guidance and support for counselling as well as medication as needed. The relationship with Jay carries on, 
Jay gets a bigger job, employs staff, is now well integrated into the whānau, and nurses grandma to the end. A life is transformed, a whānau is impacted, and a generation is changed. Many GPs see this every day. They look after large whānau, and they know that their intervention early on in a patient's life, based on a trusted relationship with a skilled, wide-ranging expert, has transformed the patient's outlook, opportunities, and mental well-being. So what does transformation do mean in practice? I have a counsellor in my practice. I employ a social worker funded through grants and donations, and we have a psychiatrist who comes in every two months to talk through our patients. So we have the skills and guidance to deal with the complex top 20% that we deal with every day. In a recent survey, we went out to our members and asked them to tell us about their daily mental health and addiction consults. Unsurprisingly, the results overwhelmingly indicated that GPs are in high demand for mental health services. We ran the survey as an idea of the volume of mental health that GPs deal with. We had 183 responses. Those 183 GPs saw 3,486 patients in one day. That's an average of 19 appointments per GP. Of the total consultations done, 1,089, that's 31%, and concluded a component relating to mental health or addiction. Of those consultations, 522, that's 48% of them, resulted in a prescription for medication related to mental health or addiction. And 217, that's 20%, were referred on to other services for mental health and addiction issues. Many of the comments were that this is in no way reflects the amount of time that each of these consultations take. Clearly, GPs are very busy in the mental health space, and this is only a snapshot of one day. It's an ever-increasing demand for mental health services, and GPs are generally the first port of call. They also provide care at the extreme end of mental health care. Until recently, funding was the most risky top 3% who had a mental health condition, and Hi Ara Oranga recognises the need is closer to 20%. We see that in our 30% we see every day. As much as we are the first port of call for many of our patients, mental health concerns, GPs are not immune to mental health issues themselves. Working is, is extremely challenging and the obstacles to overcome throughout a career in general practice are numerous. I've already touched on the sheer pressure we are under to provide mental health care to patients and the demand for these services is only increasing. I, mean, I mentioned our psychiatric visits. I remember some years ago I was berated by a patient that if anyone committed suicide, it was the doctor's fault. I had had three people take their own lives in the six months prior to that. Two were in a mental health facility already, and one of them had been drinking alcohol. I was feeling particularly vulnerable that day, and I told my rather aggro patient that I could not have this discussion with them. And as soon as they walked out the door, I rang my friendly psychiatrist and said, I think I need help. But we all do need help at some stage. General practitioners are quite deeply invested in the care of their patients and want to do the best. I talk to my depressed patients a lot about how frustrations and not being able to do, fix things is a common cause of depression and anxiety. And GPs deal with frustrations and inability to fix things every day. There are a range of factors that make caring for not only our patients, for ourselves, particularly difficult. A dearth of GPs in New Zealand, a retiring GP workforce, and a lack of GPs and practices in rural areas, underfunding, complexity of health need, and a complex health system, and many, many more constraints. G GPs are under immense and increasing pressure to see more patients, to manage more complicated health issues, and to work after hours and to forget, forgo more breaks for paperwork. We did another survey in 2018 on our workforce. This showed that 26% of respondents rated themselves as being burnt or burnt out. This had increased from 22% in 2016. More significantly, in our older age group from 54 to 60, the numbers were between 30 and 31%, or 33%. On a positive note, doctors in general are made of tough stuff, but we cannot rely on that completely. During Mental Health Awareness Week, we again surveyed members, they love our surveys, um, and we asked what things they do to help themselves stay well and, and respond to the wide, the responses were wide and varied. Gardening, tramping, playing the guitar. Lots of walking dogs. I knit so I don't unravel. I knit so I don't kill people. 
yoga, organising stuff, spending time with family, a day off while children are in childcare. <laughs> this is a real novelty. Um, mountain biking, encouraging my three-year-old to gr grow vegetables so one day he might eat one. <laughs> Menial admin around the house while singing loudly. Reading and walking, just reading. Cooking, clucking at chickens. <laughs> one would concern about their mental health there. Um, scuba diving, eating the crayfish your patients give you because they go scuba diving. So GPs agree that there needs to be a better access and changes and transforma transformation in primary health care. GPs welcome the mental health initiatives, the wellbeing budget and the opportunities that are rising. But GPs would remind you that mental health never occurs in isolation. Patients have complex social and physical health needs along with mental health issues. GPs deal daily and well with this higher end of the mental health spectrum, but the pressure is on. Although personalised healthcare may feel like a luxury, how many, how many of you would want to go to see your doctor? Talk to your GP. How many of you have turned up to your GP to discuss your sore tie but really wanted to talk about the dark parts of your heart and soul and that, tell them that you would tell no one else? I'm not saying that no one else can do some of this work, but general practitioners' wide-ranging scope of practice makes them expert in both mental and physical health, and they are integrating, integrally related. Having access to other services within in the practice is essential and beneficial to the patient, but also mitigates the frustrations of general practitioners and patients. I've employed people that are appropriate for the community I work in, but, I have met, may, but what I have may not work somewhere else. The services that are being funded through the health and wellbeing budget need to be wide and varied. Thank you.